Okay guys, so in this video we are going to talk about sessions and JSON web tokens. Won't that be exciting? Now we are going to cover some basics about these two concepts and I'll also share with you basically when I think that one is a better idea than the other. I will for complete, completeness sake say that you can for the most part use both of these to do mostly what you want to do. It doesn't really matter all that much. I think that session, depending on your use case, one is a little bit nicer, at least from my experience, than the other, but they will do the same sort of thing. One is, like for example, sessions is a little bit, in my opinion, more work to set up and manage in a distributed system, but they're very, very, very nice for a traditional web application where you might have a single instance where the, that's pretty much at, my, at least my point of view. And JSON Web Tokens is, in my opinion, a very nice thing to use when you have a distributed system or an API of some sort where you don't really want to manage any type of state on your server. Now I'll show you why in this demo project of mine. So first and foremost, we are going to mention some things, things to think about. And as I said, like sessions are a little bit more tricky to use when you have multiple instances of your, of your application. Basically you're using something like containers or multiple virtual machines or anything like this. But I want you to know that sessions are far by far and wide, the most common way to handle authentication of users overall. Now you have all, you of course have JSON web tokens or JVTs and what I like about them is that they're extremely easy to use when it comes to using Docker or containers and distributed systems. However, you should be aware of that JSON web tokens are something that you are sending to the user. You're including information about the user, the things that you want to store about the user in a token and you're sending that to the user which means that you can at no point and I, I urge remember this you cannot I repeat you cannot send any type of personal information or sensitive data in your web token do you do not put passwords or anything like that in a web token. Never ever ever do that because it is not secure which means that if a hacker gets hold a hold of that token they can in theory decrypt that and get all that personal information. That is not as easy with sessions. In sessions they can get a hold of the session the, the session ID or the session cookie and use that to access the system that the user has been validated to. So that's basically called session hijacking. That's a very different matter because now they at least have to go to our servers and kind of use exploits and other things. And there are ways to secure yourself against this as a developer. I'm not going to touch on that, but it is possible. However, that is not the case for JSON web tokens. So remember that. Now, Let's see here. Yeah, I find a good rule of thumb for JSON Web Tokens is to only include the user ID but never actually storing the data connected to the ID in the token. And then you use the ID to grab the, grab the data that is associated with that user from the database. So I'll show you exactly how this works, a basic example. You can do more advanced stuff like this, but just remember this. JSON Web Tokens are powerful. They're very convenient for us as developers, but you have to remember don't include too much information in them. So, and finally, JSON Web Tokens, tokens of course, also puts a, a little bit more work on the client because now you're sending a token to the client and the client now needs to make sure that that token is always, always included in the request that the client is then going to make to your system. Enough talking, let's get into it. So first and foremost, we have our server set up here. So basically we're inc including the app file, which is this file here, and we're listening on port 3000. Then we have a, uh, let's actually look at the application first and foremost. So we use an express server, we use express session, and then we have a library called JSON Web Tokens. We start up Express and then we declare a session with a very, very awesome secret. The, don't do this, this is just for demo purposes. This secret should be much more secure. Some very, very random string of any kind, basically. And then we have the root endpoint, which is going to get the authorization header 
and basically that's where we assume that our JSON web token is going to be stored. So we're grabbing that, getting the token, then we use our library to decode the token if there is a token. If there is no token we simply return an empty object. And then finally we are going to set the uh, uh, JSON response basically with an ID, process environment app ID. So basically we're going to set, I'll show you that in just a moment, we're going to set an ID taken from our environment which which is where we're running our server just to identify which of the, which container we're actually hitting when we are making requests this will all make sense in just a moment and then we go to our session we grab the user id that we set on the session if we have one and then we grab our decoded token and we grab the user id from the decoded token and we send all of that back we have a session endpoint that is going to put a user ID with some string on our session and then we re simply return a JSON response with our app ID and a message saying that we did so. Then we have a JSON web token or JVT endpoint that is going to sign a token. It's just, a, as you can see, this is just a JavaScript object where I put a key and a string and then I have a secret just as in the session. I create this token, I set a header, the authorization header, it doesn't have to be this, uh, this is just a practice basically. And then you set the token and then finally you just return a JSON response with the message saying that you succeeded. So let's just quickly glance at the Docker file for this container. So we are going to create a node container. We are going to copy all of the files from this directory into the source directory in our container. We're going to set the, set the working directory to source. Then we run npm install production. We expose port 3000, which is this port over here and then finally we are going to run the command when we actually spin everything up we're just going to run npm start which is going to start up our server because we have this little script here all right i hope you're following along so far okay so finally we are going to look at docker well not finally but we're going to look at the docker compose file because we need to look at that as well so what we're going to do now is that we are going to create a cluster with an nginx instance and two separate services that are basically the same. The, we're just going to create two of these servers and run them in parallel. So we're going to build from this directory and then as we saw earlier that we set the env an environmental variable called app ID with the name of the of the container that we're going to run or the ser the service name basically and this is just so that we can see in our, in my demo here which of the services we're actually talking to. And then we bind my laptop's port to port, port 3000 to the container's port 3000. And for session two, we bind to 3001, but still inside the container, it's gonna be the same port. And then we have an Nginx instance. We grab the latest one. We bind the port, my port 8080 to its port 8080. And then we have this volumes, base, uh, volumes uh, property here which is going to grab the default conf from my little project here. We're going to touch on that in just a moment. And then we simply bind that to inside of the container. This is where the default configuration for Nginx is, is found inside of the container. And finally, we declare that we depend on session one and session two so that when we run our Docker Compose command, we wait until these two are, are up and running before we start Nginx. All right. Finally, we have our Nginx setup. This is a dirt simple one. You can make much fancier setups than this, but this is just for demo purposes. So you declare an upstream with a name. And basically what this means is that you now have, think of it as a collection of, in this case, it's a collection of two different servers. So what Nginx is going to do now is that it's going to look, I've declared two servers basically with the same name as my services that I declared here in Docker, my Docker Compose file. What that means is that when we Docker Compose spins everything up, it's going to put inside of the host file, inside of the Nginx container, it's going to declare these two host names with an IP that is dynamic, every, well, not dynamic, dynamic, but fairly dynamic every time we set up a new network between our containers. So this name here is going to be resolved to the IP address of session one, and this is going to be resolved to the IP address of session two. And these are the ports that, as we saw earlier, that these two are running on.
Finally, we have declared our server, which is our Nginx server. It's running on port 8080. And whenever we hit the root of our Nginx server, it's going to proxy that request to basically the app. This is the thing that we declared up here. So the behavior that by default is gonna be here is that every time we con contact or we send a request to Nginx, it's going to first send the request to session one. And next time it's gonna send it to session two and then it's going to send it to session one. And it's basically basically just going to do a round robin strategy. It's going to switch between these on every request. And this is called load balancing, which means that you can have multiple instances of the same application running on a system. And whenever somebody contacts it, it's just going to send it depending on whatever rules you have declared to different boxes. The, this, is in, this is the basics of, of a distributed system in, in essence. But enough talking, let's actually look at how this works. Docker Compose up, and we'll put that in daemon mode so that Docker actually sets everything up and I don't get tied up to, uh, yeah, my terminal doesn't get tied up or anything like that. Go Docker PS. And as we can see here now, everything is running as expected. We have these two session, session one and session two, and then we have Nginx running as expected. Now let's take a look at Postman. Postman is basically just a way for me to do, it, you can check it out, it's fairly popular. It's just a way to do different HTTP calls and so forth. So here we have my setup. If I now do a send request to localhost 3000, we can see that Oh, I'll actually not include this because it's a little bit distracting. So I send a request to localhost 3000 because we saw earlier that I am binding my ports here. So I'm binding 3000 to 3000 on session one and 3001 is going to be session two. So if I send it to 3000 and, uh, 3001, we go to session two, as you can see. Easy peasy, right? And this is where it gets interesting. So now, I am going to session uh, session one. If I do slash session here, what's gonna happen is that, yeah, session one just now set a session cookie on my browser. So now I have a session. I go to root and as we can see, the session user ID as we saw earlier has now been declared on my session, which is awesome. I can also go to slash j uh, JVT and what's going to happen now is that in the headers, the response headers, I actually get this authorization token. Now I can copy paste this token here and put it in here, include it like that. And when I now hit the same endpoint, ta-da, I have a session. So now I have a user or a JSON web token session or a token that has this information and I have a session on the server which also has this information. Awesome, right? Now, what I'm gonna show you next is why I like, personally, JSON Web Tokens. You can set up sessions with Nginx and a few other tricks. There's more stuff you can do with sessions, but this is where I kind of feel it's easier to just use JSON Web Tokens, because if I do this now, notice that my session just went away. Why is that? Well, if we look at the code, what's happening now is that I just hit the session two instance of my application. And that is not where I have my session. I have a session cookie for session one, but not for session two. So when I hit session two, it's gonna look and see that there's no session matching the included cookie, the session cookie that I'm including. So it's just going to declare a new session and send me that cookie. And my browser, since it's on the same domain, is going to overwrite the session one cookie. So I just lost my session on session one. If I go back now, I don't have my session anymore. And this is where it's so beautiful with JSON web tokens. This is what's so elegant. As long as I have this, all my data, this entire information, I could put all kinds of information here. It's all included in this encrypted little or hashed little string. So I don't have to depend on the server. It doesn't matter which server I go to because they both can interpret this information. And if somebody tries to mess with it like that, it's going to simply not work. That's the beauty of JSON Web Tokens, at least from my perspective. It's, uh, as I've said before, it's not the perfect, I, if I had a single session 
on a single container, it wouldn't make much sense to use JSON Web Tokens. But if you're using multiple instances, I think it's kind of nice. And finally, I'll show you just what happens with Nginx if I do the same thing. So here we are. We're now hitting Nginx, which is running on port 8080. And if I now click send again, we're going to session two, session one, session two, session one, session two. It just keeps on going, right? And as you can imagine, if I now do session like that, I got my session, awesome. And now I try to go to the root, nothing happens. Why? Because I got the session on session on my session two instance, but since it's since next the next request is going to go to session one, hey, the same problem reappears again. Session one, the session one instance is just going to overwrite my existing session cookie. So hopefully this has illustrated a little bit about the differences between JSON web tokens and sessions. And as I said before, my rule of thumb is if you're making a basic website with just a single computer or a single Docker container, something like that, you're not using multiple containers or anything like that, go with sessions. They're, they're fairly simple and they're very powerful. If you want to be a little bit more innovative and use distributed systems, at least have a look at JSON web tokens. You can still use sessions and do the same thing. It's just that I think it's very, to me, it's very, it's very easy to use JSON web tokens. Hopefully this was useful. Have a great day.